out here, you get a great view of how the canyon is starting to change. Every class includes history of some kind. We're really proud of this. This was built during the Art Deco age. We are the next generation. We have a, a strong voices, and uh, we could uh, we could actually change the world, and not just the world, but this place. Youth Summit to me is a place to learn, have fun, and explore Colorado. It's fun and uh, engaging and it definitely gives you a new look at everything around you. You saw it wrong! <laughs> Welcome to the U to Indian Museum. And I'd like to for one more time of joy and happiness having you do my Lulu again. We do that as Native people in many joys of celebrations. So here today is a celebration having you come to this part of southwestern Colorado. I want to share a gift with you because I would like for you to write on this paper smiles and good thoughts. I use this a lot and this is something that as you leave when you're done with your program here, you leave with smiles and good thoughts. So my language, Pilar Maya, thank you, and smiles and good thoughts. See, our history is written in the land, and the Utes covered all of Colorado, so their history is covered, their footprints are everywhere throughout Colorado. I think it's pretty cool. I like how they're teaching us about how they lived and what, how they survived and how they got around. I thought it was really interesting how like everything has some type of color in it. To promote the museum, I would explain how, you, how unique the museum is and how uh, the museum exhibits show the diversity of the people. And what we're dealing with here today is the shelter aspect, okay? These are commonly referred to wikiups. And these folks, the Unidians, the Shoshones, the Arapahoes, all people, probably way back into time, made what we call expedient wooden shelters. This is a little piece of archaeology that isn't going to be here much longer. They're made out of wood. They decay. They burn up in forest fires. So it's a little piece of ancestry for those people that don't have Ancestry.com. We take close-up photographs of the wiki-ups and any other wooden features. Sometimes what we have are wiki-ups or we'll have what we call horizontal poles. They might be between a tree or they might be on two other sticks holding them up, never hang things on them. And gathering this information back together, we can give a little bit of that back. We can give it back to the Ute people, back to the Arapaho people, back to the Shoshone people, whatever area we're working in whatever people were using this type of structure. We can give some of that back, and that's a pretty cool thing. The nomadic life, it wasn't just plants. It's all the habitat for all the animals, and all of it working together. It's right here, and that was the way the, the Utes lived. Our favorite plant was the Woods Roast. It was used um, to treat uh, people who had respiratory illness, and in it was vitamins A, collected, dried, and stored in the fall and tend to 
Pisces as her blood stream. What we appreciated was um, how it gave us like a look into the past and how they used each plant and how they used their resources around them. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how to think like archaeologists. Okay, it's a really important concept about archaeology and also really for a lot of other sciences as well. The boys in the water. That is an observation. We're called the walk of the goat butt and that's an inference. Yeah. I just so picked one of these bad boys. I just like no, Yes, that's an arrow. Yeah. This is also like, part of yeah. an arrow bed. Because wouldn't they attack like arrowheads to like spear sets? Yeah. Oh, uh, they build, but they make utilities because they use a lot of ceramics like in order to like Indian boil and like make certain uh, foods. So we figured that this could be associated with a more hunter-gatherer society simply because of the, the sharp nature of the objects and the types of activities that they would perform. So we figured we could date this approximately by comparing it to objects of similar styles. Good, okay, so what activities do you see too? Um, probably hunting, maybe some sort of like carving, like uh, not necessarily carving, but just like crafting something. Yeah. But a lot of arrowhead type stuff, so probably just cool. The artifacts mainly tell you that they were very skilled with intricate details because of the ways that they had their patterns and their designs. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Uh, the term atlatl, A-T-L, A-T-L, is actually an Aztec word, uh, yiddo aztecan language, which means that's their, their language. And uh, this weapon, we know, has been around for at least 20,000 years, probably even longer. Uh, you can find cave paintings in France that depict people using atlatls. And those cave paintings are over 20,000 years old. Look at that! Very good! Good job! Good job!
I'd like to thank you for closing your eyes, and I hope you have envisioned yourself doing something wonderful on this earth for yourself, because you're the individual that knows what you want and no one else does. Thank you. an incredible, uh, significantly important site that uh, was purchased by the Archaeological Conservancy to protect it forever as an archaeological resource. And thanks to the help of many volunteers and site stewards, it's protected and also shared with others. Welcome to Shavano Valley. I'm Russ. In a minute, we're going to go through this crack in the rock, if you decide to do so. And I'll say this because this is a very spiritual journey for some of the youths. Uh, some of the youths will not even go through this crack until they're spiritually ready to make the journey. The petroglyphs in here are thousands of years old. They predate the youths. The youths as a nation that we know have only been in this area for about five to six hundred years. The petroglyphs in here are many thousands of years old. See this guy here? This is probably a big horn sheep because it's got the straight antlers. This one is more like a wolf or possibly a dog. It's like an animal track right here. Bear tracks pointing upward is very symbolic for the Native Americans. It signifies the bear coming out of hibernation in the spring, which is a good thing because these people lived off the land. Wintertime was kind of a not real good for picking fruit. <laughs> Uh, so springtime was always a, a renewal of life type thing. The Utes and all Native Americans pretty much believe that we are actually born from Mother Earth, okay? That we emerge from Mother Earth. Now you look back there, in the journey we just made, we just came out of Mother Earth. This was a gathering spot for Native Americans for thousands and thousands of years. It's a perfect spot to gather in the spring, reunite, get a plan going, have a spiritual journey, if you wished, and then disperse for the summer, do your hunting gathering up in high country. I thought it was very spiritual, because if you look, as soon as you get out, it looks like you're coming out of Earth, just as, the, just as they believed that all humans came from Earth. We talk about that really thin line and it's coming out of this crack here. This is called Rock Incorporation. And it represents this whole valley that's right behind you. The second, they're using this again as a crack cave you just came out of. So he's coming out of hibernation, he's going up to the tree, he does that little dance in front of it. Now this is a sacred tree because it has roots on the bottom, it has five branches, and it forks at the top. So it's uniting that upper world with the underworld that way that we'll see at the sacred tree at the very end. Woo! Yay! Woo! And when we come here to celebrate, we need to call everybody together. That's done by the first thunderstorm of the season. Kaboom! And then we start traveling to this point. This is the sign. You have arrived. This is where we're going to camp. When I worked with the Southern Ute elder, he's down here, and I said, well, I feel like I'm kind of the intruder. And he said, not if you come with gratefulness in your heart, respect for what was left behind, and thankfulness for being there. So it is with that attitude, every time I come out here, I leave a special gift. I think uh, walking through the uh, crack cave or bear caves, they called it, um, it was a really cool formation. And seeing the like like thousands of years old uh, petroglyphs was uh, really interesting. Looking out over this valley and seeing, you know, what they would have seen, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years ago, and thinking that, you know, we've come so far, but, you know, just they were able to get by without all this stuff that we have today, and just thinking that. 
you know, they were able to communicate with each other without cell phones, which I think was really cool. Welcome to the Montrose County Historical Museum. You guys walked into the Denver Rio Grande Railroad Depot that was built in 1912. It is on the National Historic Registry as a building and on the state, and it is also our county landmark. So it has three designations, so it's a pretty important building. So a couple important artifacts out here that you guys need to pay attention to is we have the stagecoach. It is one of the top 10 significant artifacts in the state of Colorado this year by History Colorado. It actually went over Red Mountain Pass uh, and it was used in two movies, Tribute to a Bad Man in the 1950s, and a person named Debbie Reynolds wrote in it for how the Wild West was what. Another significant artifact is we had the slide ruler that was chosen two years ago. It was used to map out the Gunnison Tunnel and it was only an inch off. So when you learn about that, that's kind of neat. changed throughout the years. Oh hey, didn't see you there. Welcome to my crib and come on to the caboose, which is also known as crummy or doghouse. It may not look like much from the outside, but it's been in use since 1830 to house train men. So from the inside, there's a lot more that meets the eye. Our caboose actually takes things from here to all over. It brings in people and culture and this Caboose used to actually be an office for the conductors who would set up camp here. Thank you for letting us introduce our caboose to you. If you are interested in more, come visit the Montrose Historical Museum in Montrose, Colorado. <laughs> well, welcome to Montrose, and uh, we have some interesting things to offer. We're really looking forward to your input, things that appeal to you, as young people because we want more and more young people coming here. So this is the Knights of Pythias Lodge. It's built in uh, 1909 and in this building then they had meetings, they planned the future of the community, uh, they would think about things that we wanted to do as a community. Uh, the owner of this has come up with these plans. The whole point of preservation, it's a beautiful building that generations and generations to come get to enjoy and they get to learn about the history of our communities through the buildings and the places that remain. To bring it all together, Main Street communities exist to create unique and desirable communities, places where people want to live. So people who can work from home actually come here to work so that they have some socialization and community building. And then all of a sudden, um, this part of Main Street started to kind of pick up. We're really proud of this. This was built during the Art Deco age back in 1920s or 30s. And, uh, and, and look at it, people come here every night for movies, modern movies, you know, with surround sound and everything. So they've maintained the character of this building, but we're getting a real modern use out of it. And so uh, that's, I think, what this is all about. Thank you so much for being here and bringing your intellect and your energy to us. You're coming at it from a whole new generation of eyes, and we need to hear what you think. So please, don't hesitate to share what you know. And we've got a lot of activities and things that you can participate in where you can help us to do just that. You're gonna notice the canyon's gonna get deeper, it's gonna get narrower, it's gonna get steeper. And that's maybe kind of hard to believe after your first overlook back there and how, how steep it looked there, right? Uh, at that point at the visitor center, we were only about 1,800 feet deep to the bottom of the canyon. 
So at the end of our drive today as we turn around, it's just under 3,000 feet deep. So that's only in a six mile section. So this thing does start to drop really, really quick and get really, really narrow. things to remember, right? Steep, deep, and narrow. That is what Black Canyon is really known for. It's because of that river. Hard to believe that river was right here at this level we're standing on right here about two million years ago. I got you. Right. Okay, now go. I can't get it. This is a spot some of the first explorers through the canyon um, made their, their fateful journey through what's called the Narrows. They actually just used little rubber air mattresses and they, the boats were just crushed and shattered on earlier expeditions. So they figured the only way they could do it was just to get on a little flotation device, like putting those little water wings on, right? Now this was 1900 water wings, just like an air mattress. So they jumped in this roaring river and we were sucked under these rapids, popped out the other side okay. That was the first trip through Black Canyon. It happened right there. So if you look at the Act of Congress, they re-established us, redesignated us as a national park back in 1999. Congress finds that, number one, Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Monument was established for the preservation of its spectacular gorges and additional features of scenic, scientific, and educational interest. Um, you're going to find night skies actually pop up in this too in 1999. You know, in the 1930s when we became a monument, there were dark skies everywhere. Right? We hardly had light pollution in this country because it was still a pretty rural country. You know, most people were still living on farms. Um, now we've become more of an urbanized uh, society uh, throughout the world. We're seeing light pollution encroaching into our wild areas and finding the national parks are sometimes the last dark places left. So in 99, they started to recognize that, that hey, Black Canyon, wow, it's a, it's a spectacular gorge, but also it's preserving a lot of this too. We need to know what would reach you. What messages interest you? How do we share that message? And the only people that can answer that is you. So today is all about you speaking up and telling us what you want to see in your national parks. And you have made a difference. We have changed the movement of a major highway. We have moved a visitor center from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. We were a voice in that. We were also the voice that suggested and made the big Colorado map happen in History Colorado on the floor. We changed the name of a tour in Denver. We made some things more interactive and we believe we've saved a building at the National Western Stock Show. Your voice makes a difference. What purpose do you think it is to preserve wilderness? Why do you think it's important to set aside places that are designated human-free? That a human should only visit and not remain. That's how it's written in the Wilderness Act of 1964. We need to save them so that the animals that live here can also live in peace and they don't have to adapt to the human way of life. What do you think people get out of being in wilderness? Is peaceful, serenity, 
So when they come out into these places without all the carbon dioxide and all the crazy traffic and all the road ragers, they can just sit down on a rock or just sit down on the trail and be calm and in the quiet. And the crazy part is we're 2,000 feet above it. Could you imagine what that river would sound like if you were standing next to it with the sounds echoing off the canyon wall? It would be deafening. These are areas that are important to my people, um, indigenous people of all over the world because we seek out these wild spaces where nobody's been for that very reason to connect and establish our relationship. I think I heard somebody speak of relationships. To establish our relationship with Mother Earth, to find that solitude, to help us connect with what our visions are. I think the best part of the geology exhibit was definitely the microscope because it's like the only thing that's very like you can touch it and like you can actually interact with it and it just helps everybody learn a little bit more. They uh, should change the font, uh, the font colors and they should make it a little bit bigger because some parts of the board is um, light colored and it's almost the same color as the color of the font so it's kind of difficult to read. So this is what we're imagining it should be in the middle as like an overview of the all the events because when you walk in and see all the exhibits you unless you read everything you really don't know what's going on. Yeah possibly give it like some texture design to make it not look so much of like a straight V and have it look more like a canyon. I think something was missing where, where are the perspectives about the indigenous people and what about the children's perspectives? These are fabulous ideas. So thank you, thank you. I'm so glad you wrote them down so they won't ever get lost. They've been really cool. Yeah, we've done a lot of cool things like we saw the petroglyphs, we saw the whole canyon. The view out here is great, it's stunning, and just everything about this trip has been awesome. Cimarron, this area, as you'll hear in forest talk, it used to be developed. Humans used to live here and there was a town. So a lot of invasive species live here because the humans brought them here. In the areas where humans don't typically go, you're not going to find as many of these invasive species. So this is a good par par uh, part of the park for you to come with us and help us pull up some of these species. Getting gloves for protection. Yep. How do we tell stories about mankind's inhumanity to mankind? In a way, telling uncomfortable stories, you just have to tell it the way it is. But we're in the 21st century, obviously, and things have changed. So you have to tell it in a neutral sort of way, in which case it, it's obviously uncomfortable, but you need to consider the fact that, that it happened. And I think that telling things from both sides of the story is more critical than telling it in an unbiased way because it helps you establish perspective from both sides of the story. We can't live in this life if we want to change or if we want to seek a better tomorrow without telling those stories. So to a certain respect, we have to keep telling these stories as uncomfortable as they may be. 
our first question is what does Black Canyon mean to you? Your visions, your voices, they've been amazing so far. And I cannot wait to stand in the town hall meeting tomorrow with you guys and to hear what you recommend to the current leaders of our area. The balance is deciding whether or not that historic preservation should take priority or whether we're going to completely paralyze our ability to do anything else uh, in, in the modern world or into the future. Um, the situation we were giving was that we had to build a mountain bike trail from the top of the mesa down into Palisade. There were a couple things we had to consider when moving the bike trail out of the way. So we had to consider um, if we were going to be cutting through any private property and location for the trail. We also had to consider um, how far away from the artifact we needed to be in order for it to be a safe distance. You have to consider both the human use, the historical use, and the public use of that land. And the issue that we were faced with was that there is an old train depot located next to a railroad that's been deemed like dilapidated and not structurally sound. And the issue is that the railroad company wants to demolish the building. So within the community, if everyone really cares about the building, or at least a small amount, we can start fundraising while either going on social media or within the town to try to raise more money. If you are passionate about that, if this is really important to you, you absolutely can influence that. And like I said, you guys are technology natives. Social media is an awesome place to get the word out and you can be very young and have a big influence on social media. Obviously, you all who are participating in this are interested in historic preservation and you've probably done your own research. So it's not really as vital that, uh, you know, that we reach out to you necessarily so much as it is for you to reach out to your friends and family and educate them as to why historic preservation might be important. Well, good morning, panel and guests and youth stomach. We're so delighted you're here. I'm Ann Pritzloff. I'm the director of the Preserve America Youth Summit. And what we're going to do today is the, hear the recommendations of students who have just spent the last four days exploring many different places in the Montrose region. We want to kind of expand on what we heard earlier about the virtual reality and how that could be an interesting modern way to show people more than what they get to see already because we always get to see the vision of the canyon down, but we never get to see from the bottom up. So kind of just new perspectives and new ways to see this gives everybody a unique opportunity to experience it in their own way. We thought that at the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Parks Visitor Center, we'd like to suggest a, to create a five senses experience. To start we, with the geology exhibit, a rock wall would be built to represent the different sizes of the rocks around the canyon while sounds of the river fill the area. It was like really far away so you could barely see any of it. So I think maybe we should put like maybe like the binocular stations that you see like at the Statue of Liberty and things like that on the overlooks so that people can look closer at the canyon. Like now we have to be printers and what would be cool is trying to make a mold or a figure of the same thing that you can like interact with but you don't have to actually touch that real items. So we came up with kind of our own that you guys could possibly use. So the first one is hashtag preservation party, hashtag rock my park, yeah. hashtag pose in Montrose, hashtag have the nerve to preserve, hashtag it pays to preserve which is a little homage to 
the Youth Summit, and then hashtag Dark Sky Rises, which is also an homage to the um, Dark Sky program that we have in uh, Los Angeles. There should be a one or two night camp for teens where they can experience all the complex activities of the Black Canyon, uh, sightseeing, camping, stargazing. They learn about wilderness, how to camp, how to respect the parks. An idea that I had for the Ute Indian Museum that really engages the hands-on and kinetic activity learning that youth need, because not everyone learns the same way. And we could make paper moccasins out of, you know, maybe paper bags or plastic bags and string, and we can have patterned tribal designs that kids can color in. So it's important to share the stories because we can protect the sites if we find a meaning behind the, story, the history. After this summit, we plan on growing and becoming more of an example and a leader to others and get them involved in Montrose with the Black Canyon or the Youth Indian Museum. Your voice does matter, and it's things like this that give us hope for the future. Now it's your turn. You guys need to be staying right involved with this program. Cover these people up with your ideas. Make sure that their inboxes are full. It's up to you. You've taken the time. You've gotten yourself educated. Now it's up to you.